A few years ago, I was leading a support group for parents who had children on the autism spectrum. On this particular day, we were focused on helping to address some of their children's challenging behaviors. A black father was seated across the room from me and be began to describe his son's challenging behaviors. And in many ways, it was a story that I had heard before. Um, he said that his son often tantrum when he exited stores because he seemed to associate stores with getting new toys. And I said to the father, you know, one strategy could be to allow his son to carry, to carry a favorite toy that he already owned into the store. And I'll never forget the somewhat quizzical look that came across his father's face when I said that. And then he said something to me that reminded me that his experience of America was different than the white mothers who were also a part of this group. He said, I can't do that because they'll think I stole something. He was telling me about his experiences as a black man in America, and they were ones that I immediately identified with. And in that moment, I began to flash forward in my mind and contemplate if the experiences of this black father were so different, then what would be the experiences of his black and autistic son? The term intersectionality was coined 30 years ago by a black legal scholar named Kimberly Crenshaw. It was meant to refer to how issues of race, class, gender, or, or other personal characteristics intersect to affect the people's experiences and livelihood. But that simple word, intersectionality, reminds us that for many individuals on the spectrum, they are simultaneously negotiating multiple minoritizing identities. They are autistic and Black, autistic and LGBTQ, autistic and poor, or some combination of all of these. And so I think there really are a series of questions we have to ask ourselves as a field. If we truly want to advance issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, the first um, and probably most obvious, but I think the most important question is, why does this matter? It matters because some of the more replicated findings in autism research have to do with issues of racial and ethnic disparity. We find differences in the timing and identification of autism for Black and Latinx children. We find racial and ethnic differences in the quality and accessibility of services for these groups. We even find some differences in symptom presentation with studies showing that Black children are twice as likely as white autistic children to have a co-occurring intellectual disability. We've also found that um, autistic individuals who also identify as LGBT, LGBTQ have worse physical and mental health outcomes. These issues of disparity along the lines of race, class, sexuality, or gender are obviously not confined to autism. In many ways, we are in the midst of a social justice movement where many groups are rightfully demanding their seat at the table. But in order to advance these issues within autism, we need to have some common understanding of what we mean by social justice and how it is truly defined. You've likely all seen some variation of this image on the screen but it only refers to one pillar of social justice, and there are four. It refers to the pillar of equity. The idea that some groups have start off with unequal access to resources and power. Another pillar of social justice is access. Participation is another pillar, meaning that we truly provide opportunities for people to make meaningful, um, and real um, 
have meaningful and real decision-making um, input. And finally, rights. And we're talking equal and effective legal and political rights. And really all of these pillars, the pillars of equity, access, participation, and rights, all of them will have to be addressed if we want a social justice movement in autism that is truly representative, inclusive, and fair. And so the second question we have to ask ourselves, and some of you may be asking right now, is why do we need a social justice movement? There was a recent study published by Obeyed and colleagues where in 2020, where they randomly assigned 493 white college students to read vignettes that depicted an autistic child or a vignette that described a child with conduct disorder. Those vignettes were also paired with the photo of a black child or photo of a white child. They also had those students take an implicit association test, which is a computerized measure that can measure implicit racial bias. And what they found were within group racial biases. So white students were more likely to associate autism with white children and conduct disorder with black children. The opposite trend was found for black college students. So what are the implications of these findings for our field? So this map reflects the current levels of implicit bias in the United States. The darker areas of color mean that there is more implicit bias in those geographical locations. Uh, I wanna be clear about the white areas. The white areas mean that we don't have enough data in those geographical spaces to visually depict implicit bias. It doesn't mean that implicit bias is absent in those locations. But let us consider if this is the current level of implicit bias in the country, and we tend to define within group racial biases, what does this mean for reducing disparity, racial and ethnic disparity in autism identification when many of our diagnosticians and healthcare providers are white? And also remember that implicit racial bias is only one form of implicit bias. One can have implicit biases related to disability, sexuality, class, or other personal characteristics. Um, but also addressing issues related to diagnostic disparity is really only one reason that we should embark upon a social justice movement. There are really some other valid reasons. One being that if we don't move in this direction, we'll continue to privilege the voices and experiences of some groups over others. We'll also potentially continue to exclude perhaps talented individuals from the field who may be the very ones who could address some of our more vexing challenges and research questions. The final question we have to ask ourselves is, what does social justice look like in autism research and practice? What does it mean to go about the hard work of moving towards action? So I'm a researcher, so I naturally think we need metrics. Some way to measure the progress we're hoping to make as we try to advance issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, I, I also think, I feel compelled to say that me giving more talks on this issue should not be one of those metrics. But we have to determine what does it really mean to achieve racial equity in autism? What does it mean to have a field that is more diverse and inclusive? Are we referring to making sure our study samples are more racially and ethnically diverse or socioeconomic, socioeconomically diverse? Are we referring to recruiting more researchers of color into the field? Are we referring to doing more research on under, um, families or children from underserved communities? Are we referring to making sure that more 
autistic stakeholders are involved in research planning and implementation? Or are we referring to all of those things? Perhaps we are. I certainly have some ideas on things I think we should consider as we move forward in this direction and try to embark on this idea of social justice and advance these important issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion. The first is when appropriate, our research methods should always give voice to stakeholders. So should, we should use such methods as community partner research um, methods where appropriate. Second, we should recruit and retain more researchers of color, including autistic researchers of color into the field. We also need to figure out how to best support these groups so that researchers from these groups so that they don't continue to feel marginalized. Third, I feel strongly that we must consider the strengths and not just areas of deficit and risk for families of color or those who have been historically marginalized. Our research should serve to promote resilience and strength and not reinforce stereotypes. And finally, we just have to keep the conversation going. It's easy to let these issues backslide as other issues arise in the field, but we're gonna to have to have some difficult conversations about how issues of systemic racism, ableism, and xenophobia affect the lives and outcomes of autistic individuals and their families. You know, and in the words of Martin Luther King Jr. who spoke about the fierce urgency of now, he said, this is no time for apathy and complacency. This is the time for positive and vigorous action. And so I want to leave you with the words of a Black autistic mother, words of a Black mother of an autistic adolescent, um, who I think speaks to the fierce urgency of now. I can start with what does it mean to be a Black mother, period. So for us as parents, there is always an anxiety. I like to say that the, the feelings, the memory and the spirit of historical trauma and the story of Emmett Till just lies within, within our womb, within our soul in the black community. The fear of a black mother. I mean, I always say black folks are not allowed to be unapologetically themselves. They are, they are not permitted to be neurodiverse. And we, and we know this on a lot of levels. So my biggest fear is if an officer approaches my child and my child begins to stem, have to put his hands in his pocket to take out one of the little things he likes to hold on to to help him with his anxiety. He's got one of his little trinkets or things that he holds on to and reaches into that pocket to pull it out to calm himself. What's going to happen to my son? So I really think until we can answer the underlying question that this mother is, is posing of whether her son, because he is black and autistic, is much more likely to be the next Dante Wright, Philando Castile, Tamir Rice, or George Floyd, then we still have work to do. What is going to happen to her son? Thank you for having me today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Boyd. That was an amazing, very, very uh, thoughtful presentation. And I think gives us a lot of pause about things that we need to be doing better or that things that we're not doing at all. So my question is what can institutions organizations, training opportunities, and funders do to help move forward social justice? Yeah, I think, you know, these, most of these issues are obviously complex and they're gonna take systems level reform. So it's what can we do at different levels? So what can we do at the level of the provider where we can do a better job of, around training and how we think about um, these issues uh, um, of inequity? and how they may be sort of exacerbated within the healthcare space or, or those of us who see um, individuals. Um, 
on the spectrum. Certainly at the level of funding, we can think about how funders can put forth um, funding announcements that may really help to um, make it a priority that we're addressing some of these very big perplexing issues that continue to um, hold us back. <laughs> you know, we continue to see study after study showing racial ethnic disparity in a variety of ways. And so now let's fund some research that really helps us to address some of these issues. So no one group is going to be able to do everything. Uh, but I think, you know, part of it is just to continue to have these conversations, but also think what we can do given the space we're in um, and the place we occupy to address some of these issues. And I, we did get a question, one great question, many great questions, but someone actually just flat out asked, as a white clinician, how can I help more families of color? both in her practice and in her research? Yeah, well, first, the fact that you asked that question is, is, is shows awareness. And I think some of this stems from a lack of awareness. So uh, this person may know the work of Lisa Cooper, who did a lot of the work in the healthcare space of, around how doctors talk to minority patients, that white doctors tend to be more dominant in their conversations, ask fewer questions to minority patients. So I think, think about our, the interactions we're having and are we asking the same questions? Are we treating people in an equitable, equitable way? Um, or having conversations though about um, with people from those racial and ethnic groups to ask, are there things that, that you think this group is experiencing right now that would be important for me to think about? As we know, a lot of folks right now um, in particular, um, those of us in the Black and Asian community and or Asian community are dealing with trauma, racial trauma in a variety of ways. So that's certainly impacting us. And so that we, may impact how the parent of a child with autism talks to you on that day because of what they're experiencing. So, but I think it's important that you ask that question, but the awareness is a big part of it. One more final question um, is, how do we know that, what are some specifics about metrics that we can use to ensure that we're doing the right thing and doing less of the wrong thing? Yeah, I, I, again, I, I, I just put forth some ideas, but I think it's, it's part of the conversation we, we need to have. I think, I, I hope all the things I suggested were important. Certainly, I think we want our samples to be more um, representative of the actual population. I think we want um, more um, scholars of color to be um, recruited and retained in the field. I think we want more autistic stakeholders to have real and meaningful input into the research that's happening. So how do we track these things? How do we measure these things to make sure that they're happening? And, that make and to make sure that we're continuing to advance these issues. Um, because what I don't want to happen is us to stop talking about these things. Uh, because they are important. And the only way we're really ever going to address them is just to be honest about these conversations and continue to bring up these topics.